Glory to Jesus Christ. So today, Tuesday, October 6, 2020, uh, we have our Bible study on the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy, one of the pastoral epistles. And today also is the commemoration of St. A blessed Marie Rose du Rocher and Saint Bruno. And Saint Bruno was born in Cologne and lived from 1030 to 1101. He was educated in Paris and taught theology in Reims, but uh, felt a call to the contemplative life, indeed to uh, uh, basically a hermit life, but a hermit life in community. And he founded the Cathusians, an order of cloistered contemplatives. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. O God, who called St. Bruno to serve you in solitude, grant through his intercession that amid the changes of this world, we may constantly look to you alone, to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And as I mentioned earlier, also in, here in the United States and in Canada, Blessed Marie-Rose du Rocher, who was a nun, born in Saint-Antoine in Quebec in Canada. Blessed Marie-Rose, who lived from 1811 to 1849. So she was young when she passed on was the youngest of 10 children. She spent 12 years assisting one of her brothers, a parish priest, uh, in his parish. And during that time, she helped establish the first Canadian parish sodality for young women. Later, she founded the Sisters of the Holy Name of Jesus and Mary uh, for education, in particular, of girls. Let us pray. O Lord, who enkindled in the heart of blessed Marie-Rose du Rocher, the flame of ardent charity and a great desire to cooperate in the mission of the church as a teacher. Grant us that same active love so that in responding to the needs of the world today, we may lead our brothers and sisters to the blessedness of eternal life. To our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And let's pray our prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in this consolation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let's pray for our country during this time of uh, great problems and tumult. O oh, gracious Father, we pray for our country. May it truly be faithful to its mission of bringing freedom, equality, and justice for all. Fill it with a love of truthfulness and fill it with peace and harmony. Transform our hearts, transform our culture, transform our society. Where we are corrupt, purify us. Where we are in error, direct us. Where in anything we are remiss, reform us. And where our nation is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Savior. Amen. And so we're in First Timothy, the beginning of the third chapter. 
the qualica qualifications of various ministries. And so in the body of Christ, there are many ministries. Ministry comes from the word for service, one of the words for service in Latin. And that's what one is doing if one is, is ministering in the body of Christ. One is serving, serving God above all else, in particular serving God incarnate, Jesus Christ, but also serving the other members of the body. Indeed, serving people outside of uh, not just full communion with the church, but any connection, uh, obvious connection with the church. And this is uh, verse 1 of chapter 3. And the summation given in the New American uh, here says in the footnote, the passage begins by commending those who aspire to the office of bishop, episcopos, the overseer, the uh, one who has the fullness of the ordained priesthood there, within the community but this first sentence verse one may also imply a warning about the great responsibilities involved the writer proceeds to list the qualifications required personal stability and graciousness talent in teaching moderation in habits and temperament, a, minister, a magister, ministerial or managerial ability, and experience in Christian living. Moreover, the candidate's previous life should provide no grounds for the charge that he did not previously practice what he now preaches. No list of qualifications for presbyters, that's the priest, the presbuteroi, the ordained elders, they're the second level of the ordained priesthood. A p no list of qualification of presbyters appears in 1 Timothy. The presbyter bishops here and in Titus, see notes, on Titus 1, 5 to 9, lack certain function reserved here for Paul and Timothy. So it may be that Timothy is the sort of metropolitan bishop, the or the quote-unquote archbishop uh, of this, to use uh, terms that would be uh, anachronistic at the time, of he may have bishops under him. So there may be colleges of bishops, the college being a collective, uh, a cooperative collective of bishops, and then under them presbyters, uh, the priests, and then under them the deacons, although the deacons may be directly under the bishops, which seems often to be the case uh, with that. St. Ignatius, uh, in when he's mentioning the uh, calling people to live in, co in communion and in obedience to the uh, the bishops, the presbyters, and the deacons. And this is in the uh, early second century, around the year 106, 110 or so. St. Ignatius mentions that the, the bishop is the icon of God the Father. And you, then you'd think that it would be the presbyters, the priests, who would be the image of Christ. But it's the deacons that he has as the image of Christ. And, it's, and the presbyters as the College of the Apostles. So that's, that's interesting, an interesting thing, because, because the, the, uh, in, the, the bishop in... Uh, the more common imagery in the uh, early church and later is of Christ, of Christ, but also the presbyter of Christ, and in some ways the deacon as Christ uh, who serves. 
So we have that. So, so they don't uh, go into, he doesn't go into uh, a listing here. But it starts, so this saying is trustworthy. Whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task. Of course, only if he's doing it out of pure motive and not out of personal ambition uh, or uh, a quest for power over other people or for luxury or for whatever. Uh, but it has to be out of service. As uh, Father Di Lorenzo once said, of course he said, we're ordained, that is, you know, deacons, priests, and bishops, to do what Jesus did at the Last Supper, not just serve at the liturgy, the way Jesus initiated there the Eucharist at the, at the Last Supper, but to wash feet, which means service, and often a uh, service that would be viewed by the world as very uh, degrading or uh, undignified, while in actuality it's the, the greatest dignity and, uh, in, in that service, in that thing. So, uh, so he goes on to this, but why is this saying trustworthy? The footnote in the New American said, the saying introduced is so unlike others after this phrase that some later Western manuscripts read, this saying is popular. Mm -hmm. It is understood by some interpreters as concluding the preceding section, 1 Timothy 2 there. So that's, that's, it's, that's a, why is this trustworthy? That. Well, it's only trustworthy, and, for, and uh, was, could be popular among some people, but that's not. Uh, I had a, 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 there was a monk I knew, a very wise monk, who said, uh, anyone who pursues the office of bishop or abbot is automatically disqualified by reason of insanity, because of the burden that that is. The, uh, there's a room in uh, in St. Peter's Basilica uh, uh, where the uh, or in the Vatican there the, the buildings attached to it that's called uh, the Room of Tears the uh, Camera Lac Lacrimarum and um, or Box the Box of Tears uh, that would be uh, uh, where the person who's elected pope uh, puts on the the white robes of the pope for the first time. And why tears? Because uh, it's a crown of thorns, that, that office. Uh, probably of all the offices in the church, uh, the one uh, with the most grief, because it's the one with the most responsibility. The Pope is called to be a universal pastor during his term on, on earth. And so he's going to be blamed for everything. And his, he has great responsibility and uh, set up for great temptation by the devil and all this stuff to, uh, to do the opposite of what he's supposed to do or not do anything uh, in, in that area. And a bishop also, uh, the office of bishop is very uh, very filled with uh, temptations, temptations of power, of rationalization, all sorts of, of temptations. And uh, you look at the history of the church and many have really succumbed to that, especially at the time when it was a, a, a political office and uh, uh, one that uh, it was often unquestioned uh, ability for him to for the bishop to help himself to the, the funds of the church, which was not supposed to be, but often was. And many profoundly unworthy people got in. And uh, often they could be appointed by emperors or others, or that, or through nepotism, or for all sorts of uh, bad reasons. 
getting into the office, rather than going there to serve, going there to be uh, someone who is going to live a fullness of the prophetic office, which will involve a great deal of opposition and uh, problems, and maybe even martyrdom. And as a priest that is being a, a prayer leader, and especially one leading the people in the showing forth of the once offered sacrifice of Christ, the Eucharist, until he comes again. And then as a shepherd, so keeping the sheep uh, in line so that they don't wander off, and also protecting the sheep from spiritual and other predators. And that's what the bishops are called to do, and it's a big task, uh, especially nowadays. Uh, but uh, many have uh, not cooperated with the grace of the sacrament in that. But many have. We've had many saints who are bishops. And uh, we have saints who are popes. We have great sinners who are popes. We have great saints who are popes. And we've had mediocre popes and mediocre bishops, and the same with priests. And deacons. But the thing is, the, the charism, the gift of grace in ordination is uh, contains the gifts of the Holy Spirit there, and, and especially zeal. Zeal is this gift, this, this uh, and courage uh, of putting this into effect, putting the office into effect, the pastoral, the role of teacher, the role of of prayer, not just prayer inspiration, but prayer leader. And as a teacher and preacher, he has to preach prophetically and teach prophetically uh, with the, uh, the fullness of the faith, uh, in particular the morality of the faith, but also the sons, and also pointing out uh, the dangers to the faith, the heresy and all this other stuff, to be uh, that. But of course, I, I think actually in our day, the greatest threat to the faith is indifference and spiritual laziness, and uh, which cultivates ignorance. Because, you know, I can't be bothered to find out what the church actually teaches, what God's will for me actually is. And the bishops have to be calling this. And we priests also have to be doing this. And uh, deacons. And an example is very important. It would be an example of prayer, an example of the prophetic witness, putting this into effect, the pursuit of justice, the pursuit of orthodoxy, the pursuit of uh, compassion applied. Uh, very important. And, and as a shepherd, protecting the people from all of the, the evils of the world, all of the things that can uh, pollute or destroy faith with a capital F. Not to mention charity. So, so you, your desire is a noble task uh, if you want that. Uh, but it, you have to have pure motives to this. Therefore, a bishop must be irreproachable, as he said. So you can't... Uh, there's, uh, you know, great, no grave sins there, no uh, striking vices or, or personality defects. So married only once. Well, the tradition in the Catholic and the Orthodox churches, at least from the 6th century, has been that bishops are married to their diocese, to the church. And that's the one wife. And they shouldn't go off to other dioceses, although there are exceptions and there are bishops of great talent who are often uh, moved to other dioceses, uh, not to mention bishops of great ambition who uh, make sure they get moved to, to a more plum, plum diocese. Of course, they'll always claim it's, they're called by God to that, but we'll see. Uh, if, they, if they are embracing the challenge of it, that's one thing, you know. I, uh, I'm sure many would just like a, 
a, a relatively small, peaceful diocese that has a, a an orthodox and uh, applying and uh, harmonious presbyterate, the priesthood and all that, so on, to a big diocese that's well-known, that's prestigious, that has uh, big problems in it and, and issues and exhausting things and uh, uh, problems in the clergy, problems in the laity, problems in relation to uh, outside the church and things like that. So, uh, married only once. So, uh, they were bish the bishops were married. St. Peter, for example, was married. In the tradition with the small t, all the apostles except for John are married. And uh, some uh, said, oh, well, the tradition that they uh, uh, left their wives with the consent of the wife, and then they live celibately, uh, celibately after that. But there's no evidence in scripture, and uh, there's no real evidence in apostolic tradition with a capital T, or, or the uh, church fathers and things like that. So you'd see that in some cases, yes, you'd see that. But, uh, but uh, a celibate bishop became preferred because of the problem of uh, a family and that. So uh, it would be a great temptation for the bishop to uh, use the resources of the diocese for the advancement of his family, like putting uh, sons into the best parishes or this, that, the other thing. So, so, uh, but, uh, so then that was not permitted, but then we had nepotism. We had, uh, they were putting their nephews in after that. So, in fact, in the, I believe, the Assyrian church, it came to the point where the patriarchate became, that's the head bishop of the Assyrian church, became hereditary, go, going from nephew to nephew, if he had a nephew, or the closest uh, male relative if he didn't have a nephew. Um, so they have this whole listing of things that he shouldn't be and should be. Ab above all, self-controlled, temperate, so balanced, a balanced person, balanced emotionally, a balanced in his uh, approaches to, to people and all that, and a balanced in his care for all the different uh, groups in, the, in his diocese. But he should have a preferential option for the poor, as Jesus did. Uh, but uh, he has to care for everybody, and that would include also those who are uh, spiritually poor, ignorant, and others that uh, need that. So in the commentary in um, the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible there, we talked about Bishop Episcopos. Let's see if the same, uh, same root is periscope and telescope and microscope there for uh, seeing. An overseer or spiritual shepherd who carries on the mission of the original apostles. Note the titles bishop and elder slash presbyter were somewhat fluid in the earliest years of the church. And it seems that they could be used interchangeably. Acts 2017, uh, 2028, uh, Titus 1, 5 through 7. Soon, however, the distinction between bishops, First Timothy here that mentioned, elders, the presbyters, the priests, 5, 17, and deacons, 3, 8, was clearly defined and their respective titles were standardized. So you see this certainly by the time of St. Ignatius. Uh, in the, the next generation. So, because holy orders uh, becomes the apostolic sacrament, shall we say, becomes divided first in the Acts with deacons. So the apostle said it's not fitting that we should uh, uh, spend all our time uh, 
with administration or uh, other things like that, or waiting on tables is uh, the literal thing uh, there. And so the deacons were raised up to this, and there's laying on of hands, and they're ordained to this. And then sometime later, there's, there's the distinction with the uh, between episcopos and presbyteros, between the bishop and the presbyter. With the bishop having the, the full communicable apostolic function, rather than the unique charism given to the apostles, the, the 12 there. Uh, but the, uh, and then, uh, so that's, with the, uh, uh, the bishop having the fullness, so uh, the bishop ordains, but the presbyters can do all the other sacraments. In the West, the usual minister of chrismation or confirmation is the bishop, but that can be delegated uh, and then sometimes automatically delegated, like receiving someone into the church or an adult who is baptized, uh, things like that. So uh, the bishop was uh, important, and then there were these uh, these distinctions as time went on within the sacrament. As if to say that the traditions of the apostles were taken from the Old Testament, bishops, presbyters, and deacons occupy in the church the same position that Aaron, that he's the brother of Moses, who's the, the chief priest there, his sons, the Kohanim, the priests, the sacrificers, the, uh, the slaughterers there in the, uh, in the temple, uh, by the time of uh, in the time of Dave, by the time of David and Solomon, the, the restricted the sacrifice was restricted to the temple place, and the Levites, the Levites, they're the, of the tribe of Levi. Remember, in the twelve sons of, of of Jacob, Levi was one of them, and the Levites were not to be given land but were to be spread around and to be supported. And then uh, with the temple, the establishment of the temple, they were be, at least a number of them would be supported in the temple to do the sacristan work and other things, including uh, being choristers, various other things, uh, their uh, functions in the temple. And uh, <clears throat> so that became so off. So, Sometimes you read the fathers of the church and they talk about the Levites. Well, they're not talking about the literal descendants of Levi. They're talking about deacons and all that. And apostles, often, they say, often that would be the bishop uh, of that, that would be spoken of. So, and of course, the priesthood. And the word priest comes from the word presbyter, the Latin word presbyter, uh, uh, and it's a contraction of that, from probably from the Germanic priest, or, uh, or, or the others claim it really from prêtre, which is from uh, French. But, uh, and that was, uh, presbyter was, well, while it was used, that term, presbyteros, was used for elders in the synagogue and various other uh, uh, civil uh, functions of uh, of, a, of seniors. The word senate comes from the word senior, the elder in Latin, older, the comparative. Uh, so the, this is important. So the church recognizes these offices as three degrees of the sacrament, of the one sacrament of holy orders. The episcopate bishops, they have the fullness, they ordain and all that. They have a they have, uh, uh, jurisdiction uh, in the diocese, and they can uh, literally tell the priest where to go uh, in that sense, you know, to be assigned here, you go here, and uh, demand obedience uh, for the good order of the church. The presbyterate, the elders or priests, and the diaconate, the deacons. So, and it referred to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1554 through 71. Hmm. 
And so, uh, the, so this bishop is to be of one wife. He's to have all these other uh, qualities. To be irreproachable, married only once, temperate, self-controlled, decent, hospitable, able to teach. Not a drunkard, not aggressive, but gentle. Not contentious, not a lover of money. And somebody can manage his own household. Because if you can't even manage your household, that how can you manage the household of faith of a, of a diocese? Or in this case, of, of a congregation, of some sort, which would have been relatively small compared to parishes nowadays, or let alone dioceses nowadays. Three degrees of the sacrament of holiness. This is 1554 in the Catechism. The divinely instituted ecclesiastical, that's churchy, churchly, ministry is exercised in different degrees by those who even from ancient times have been called bishops, priests, and deacons. So that's from Lumen Gentium in Vatican II, 28. Catholic doctrine expressed in the liturgy, the magisterium, that's the teaching office of the church, and the constant practice of the church recognizes there are two degrees of ministerial participation in the priesthood of Christ, the episcopacy and the presbyterate, the priests. The diaconate is intended to help and serve them. So this term, reason the term sacerdos, which is a Latin for... Uh, uh, sacred one or uh, uh, sacred maker, the, someone who is uh, can do the sacrifice the in the, the literal sense of making sacred, uh, sacer facere. In current use, denotes bishops and priests, but not deacons. So we don't call deacons priests. We call bishops priests. We call presbyters priests. Yet Catholic doctrine teaches that the degrees of priestly participation, episcopate and presbyterate, and the degree of service, diaconate, are all three conferred by a sacramental act called ordination, that is, by the sacrament of holy orders. So diaconate is a participation in holy orders. Presbyterate, a greater participation in holy orders. And episcopate, the greatest, the fullest participation in holy orders. St. Ignatius of Antioch, as I mentioned earlier, and this is the quote from him from uh, to his letter to the Tralians. The Tralians sound like somebody from Star Trek or something. But Let everyone revere the deacons as Jesus Christ, the bishop as the image of the Father, and the presbyters as the Senate of God and the assembly of the apostles. For without them, one cannot speak of the church. So that to be... Uh, not just the plain A essay of the church, but in a sense, essay of the church. Not that churches that don't have apostolic succession or do not have the uh, bishop, presbyter, deacon order are not sharing in the church and are not channels of grace. But the, the, the plain A essay would be the fullness of being in the church. Uh, and it's not just the bain A essay, the the good, it's good to have it, but you don't really need it. No, it's crucial. Crucial for being actually church. <clears throat> so uh, churches that do not have apostolic succession, valid orders as recognized by the Catholic Church, are not called ecclesiae, are not called the uh, that word church, but are called uh, ecclesial communion. So the word is in there, ecclesia is in there, but they're different. They're, uh, they don't have the a crucial fullness. And uh, usually they don't have a sacramental self-understanding. Some could, uh, but not have the apostolic succession that's recognized by the Catholic and or Orthodox. But uh, most don't have what we call the sacramental self-understanding. So you know, there's 
don't believe in the real presence. Uh, they don't believe that uh, holy orders are, are a sacrament, that, they're just, that it's just ordination is the, is the choosing, perhaps, of a, by a congregation, of, uh, uh, of recognizing a call from God. But there's no, quote, unquote, ontological change in the, the in ordination as would be recognized by the Catholic and the Orthodox. So and uh, so that often the the office is the off, more on office of preacher rather than as a sacramentalizer. So uh, you know, in some of the those traditions, anyone really can do them. Anyone can be appointed as pastor. And you can say, well, we we choose you pastor, and there doesn't need to be. And the ordination is uh, the laying on of hands, which they may have. Uh, usually, uh, is, isn't really a conferring of anything, but, uh, a, a, but uh, maybe authority given by the congregation or given by uh, the, the higher levels in the particular denomination. But for Catholics and Orthodox, it's, it's very crucial. And this is, there's a real, real reality involved in this, that the, when you're ordained, you can say, this is my body, and Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, makes it so. But it's Jesus who's ministering through that. Now, of course, Jesus is ministering for anyone who's sincerely seeking to minister the name of Jesus. But here, this is, is certain that we know that. We, we know, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, Jesus said to the apostles. To the apostles, this do this in memory of me, he said that to the apostles. So uh, we accept that as I said that's crucial in the Catholic the Catholic understanding. And let's look at if you look at the Greek for this list of uh, qualifications of a bishop and also these qualifications uh, who are presbyter too you would see that in that uh, or any leader in, in the church in any level. Of leadership. Uh, and uh, but let's first look at the different translations among these four translations here. And my card that I had in First Timothy has slipped out. So I have four translations here. The New Revised Standard Version, the Revised English Bible, the New American Bible, which we're using, and the New Jerusalem Bible. So here's the listing. This is the New Revised Standard. So I'll now, a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an apt teacher, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders of a good reputation, so that he may not fall into disgrace in the snare of the devil. So in the revised English, it says, here is a saying that you may trust to aspire to leadership. So it translates episcopus as leader, which is very vague because a presbyter is a leader, and in many ways a deacon's a leader, and then there are lay leaders in the congregation. Too. So this is probably a little too vague a term. To aspire to leadership is an honorable ambition. As a bishop, therefore, a bishop therefore must be above reproach, husband of one wife. And of course, there are often many groups that have uh, bishops, uh, uh, but who say, well, you know, bishops sh should be able to marry because it says one 
one wife, uh, the tradition for presbyters and deacons uh, in the earlier church uh, and uh, up to this present day in the Eastern churches is that uh, a married man can be ordained a deacon and a presbyter, but not a bishop. And But if the wife dies of a deacon or a presbyter or, or a priest, that priest that is, uh, the uh, the widower is not to remarry. And if he needs to, then he has to resign completely from the uh, from the ministry of of, of, of presbyter or deacon. Uh, and there were some who were very strict about that wouldn't permit that either, no matter how young the children were or whatever uh, uh, what, situ what the situation was. So a bishop, therefore, must be above reproach, husband of one wife, rather than uh, married only once. This would be a more literal thing. Sober, uh, it translates that as uh, uh, what is rendered uh, sensible here is sober. And this is temperate, courteous, or respectable, or what was... Uh, self-controlled in, in the new American. Hospitable and a good teacher. So that rabbi role of a bishop and a presbyter. He must not be given to drink or brawling. Not a drunkard or aggressive, the new American would say. Brawling, stuff like that. So if a contentious person uh, should never be a bishop. This doesn't mean someone who's willing to stand up and uh, fight for the church. No, quite the, the bishop should be like that, but not someone given to to just uh, distemper and to uh, even or with, uh, with the connotations here of brawling, physical violence even, but uh, not aggressive. Assertive, yes. Aggressive, no. but must be a forbearing disposition, self-controlled, and uh, not co gentle, not contentious. Avoiding quarrels and not avaricious. That's the lover of money. They're not to be like that. So, of course, bishops have to raise money and have to talk about it a lot, encourage people to give. That's, after all, St. Paul did, and he was raising the collection for this. That's uh, something that has to be done. Uh, of course, it has to be not, uh, uh, you know, it's not, shouldn't consume an entire homily or something. Then it's not a homily or even a sermon. Uh, it's just uh, a, a, an appeal for giving. He must be one who manages his own household well and controls his children without losing his dignity. Good luck on that one uh, <laughs> your, uh, with children there. So, for if a man does not know how to manage his own family, so if he's not caring for them, if he can't control, you know, keep them, if he can't shepherd them, how is he going to be expected to shepherd people not in his own household, people he's not with all the time? How can he take charge of a congregation of God's people? He should not be a recent convert. Conceit might bring on him the devil's punishment. Well, proportionally, they're in the first generation, you know, people would be, well, it depends on what you mean by recent. They're, they're all converts. And of course, we should all be people who are continually converting, turning toward the Lord and uh, uh, deepening our spiritual life and our, our commitment on every level to the Lord. <clears throat> he should not be a recent convert. Conceit might bring on him the devil's punishment. So see how uh, egotism and other things can uh, be devastating to a leader and even more so to those under the leader. He must, moreover, have a good reputation with the outside world, that he may not be exposed to scandal 
and be caught in the devil's snare. And in the New Jerusalem Bible, it says, here is a saying that you can rely on. If you want to be a presiding elder, so it renders episcopus presiding elder, is to desire a noble task. That is why the presiding elder must have an impeccable character. Our word bishop comes from episcopos, from that. Uh, in the adjective form, episcopal, that's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I was listening to, I think it's uh, Dr. Francis Xavier, uh, can't think of his last name right now, um, Irish name, uh, from Notre Dame, I believe. Or was it Catholic? But anyway, he uh, mentions, he says, there's the word Episcopal, meaning pertaining to a bishop. This is not Bishopal or Bishop-ish. We don't have that. So here it is, the presiding elder. Double tip. That is why the presiding elder must have an impeccable character. Impeccable meaning uh, not sinful. No sins, in fact. There would be major sins there. Husband of one wife, in reference very once to that, must be temperate, discreet. It uses that word discreet there. But courteous, hospitable, and a good teacher. Not a heavy drinker, not hot-tempered, but gentle and peaceable, not avaricious. A man who manages his own household well and brings up his children to obey him and to be well-behaved. How can any man who does not understand how to manage his own household take care of the church of God? He should not be a new convert in case pride should turn his head and he incurred the same condemnation as the devil. It is necessary also that he be held in good repute by outsiders so that he never falls into disrepute and into the devil's trap. Because the devil's plan is to destroy the church, to at, at least to discredit the church. So if you can uh, get bishops and others caught up in scandals, and we see this recently in the last uh, decade or more, uh, uh, that'll turn people away. Uh, good people, sincere people, will say, well, if that's that, but they're confusing the church with the people in the church. Because yes, the church is the people, but the church isn't just the people. And there are saints in the church as well as sinners. There are, there's wheat as well as tares in the church. And uh, the commentary in the Ignatius Catholic on one wife. Candidates for pastoral ministry should not be married more than once in their lifetime. 3.12. Now, some uh, viewed this as meaning, oh, you can't be polygamous. You can only have one wife at a time. But the tradition in the church had been that uh, one wife at all, the going way back. Paul does not specify why, but his teaching somewhere elsewhere suggests that widowers who remain unmarried will be better able to devote themselves to the Lord's work. 1 Corinthians 7, 8, 32, 34, or, or remain virgin, people remain virgins and not uh, get married at all. But then they'll, be, they'll have more time, more energy, and so they have to devote themselves to the service of the church first, rather than devoting themselves to their family first, which is what you'd have to do for taking care of your children and your wife and stuff. And that widowers who pursue remarriage may be lacking the self-control effective of a minister of the gospel. And also you'd be devoting time to that, you know, so you're uh, going on the, uh, you know, dating services or whatever equivalent they had then, or hunting around rather than uh, just ministering, you know, objectively ministering. So uh, for a future wife.
So uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 9, 36, 38, about that. Uh, so St. Paul's preference is for a full-time church minister, church worker, to be a celibate, male or female. That seems to be his preference, but he says, this is what I see. And he said, this isn't a command from the Lord. On the question of colorful celibacy, uh, uh, it's something St. Paul praises, and even Jesus praises. Praises, he said, you know, for so much we eunuch for the kingdom, not literally, of course, but meaning un unmarried uh, and uh, in chaste celibacy. Uh, that he, Jesus praises that, but he doesn't ban marriage. Uh, he uh, praises marriage and and states that marriage is for life, and that it says, what God has joined together, let no man break asunder through marriage. So, uh, of course, uh, managing the household of the, the diocese, the bishop is a spiritual father for all these people. So if he can't be a spiritual father or uh, someone maintaining order and discipline in his own household, how is that going to be in the diocese? Or uh, which a diocese is a, an anachronism, a later term, uh, you know, what, what was it, a fourth century term, um, so or maybe third century term. Um, so, so there to be that, uh, so that's really crucial in his shepherding, the sign of that. So then. He moves on to deacons. Similarly, this is verse 8. Similarly, deacons must be dignified, not deceitful, not addicted to drink, not greedy for sordid gain. So, that important, uh, not drunkenness, addicted to drink, this translation says there, uh, which of course would also include any other. Uh, addictive substance, you know, drugs. Well, they did have addictive drugs in those days, too, but uh, not the, the range that we have today. Uh, but uh, not greedy for sordid gain, just like the bishops are not to have that. Not deceitful. That's an, and dignified. It doesn't mean that you, do, you know how you have good posture. It means you know, your behavior is elevating to other people. holding fast to the mystery of the faith. So the mystery doesn't mean, oh, I can't, there's just, no, uh, you just believe this, don't bring your intellect to this. That's not what that means. Uh, it's not like a whodunit sort of thing, uh, a, a, an enigma to be solved. But it is rather an experience that transcends our ability fully to explain it, so that you can experience this. So the, the faith is that, the mystery. And, and we say that at the in the Novus Ordo, at the after the words of institution, the consecration, the mystery of faith, mysterium fidei, and the, what do we proclaim? Uh, the saving death and resurrection of Christ until he comes. You know, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. At that, uh, which we don't use that one anymore. Uh, since uh, 2011. So, with a clear conscience, so that you really have faith in what you're teaching. And if not, then you shouldn't be doing it. You should be doing it here. So if you want to be a, a missionary of some other religion, uh, don't come into the church. Don't Certainly don't be ordained. Don't stay there. If you, in good conscience, cannot teach the teachings of the church, uh, or, um, or rather um, are doing the opposite of teaching things opposed to the teaching of the church, yeah, it's the hypocrisy, frankly, uh, and that, or at best, uh, total delusion. Uh, so, uh, and there are plenty of other denominations. So, you know, uh, if you can't accept uh, in good conscience. I'm not talking about people leave because it's difficult. 
no, the, the, the true faith will be difficult. If, if you have a religion that's easy to live and it has no, no effort on your part, no, no uh, strive, spiritual striving, no, uh, that just says, well, just make up your mind, uh, but uh, do what you want to do, uh, as long as it's politically correct, if it's a, a, a so-called liberal denomination. Uh, then that, uh, that's, uh, frankly, I don't think that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be interested in that. That you know, there'd be a temptation to that to uh, put, as someone said about another uh, church, uh, 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 all the pageantry of the Catholic Church, but none of the guilt. So you can just, uh, you know, no real mortal sins, stuff, stuff like that, if you want. Uh, you know, there'll be things that were condemned, but these usually, you know, political and social things, but not personal. Uh, issues, uh, and they, but anyway, uh, that I'm just generalizing here. But uh, that's uh, no that person is is sinning in, in maintaining the charade of being a Catholic priest, a Catholic deacon, a Catholic bishop, if he's not going to live it, and if he's not going to proclaim it in its fullness, and especially if he teaches what he knows is contrary to the Catholic faith. Moreover, they should be tested first. So that's why, so you don't, you don't just show up and say, I want to be this, and so he seems like a nice guy, we'll ordain him. No, there has to be a process of testing. That's what the seminary uh, is about. Uh, that other thing is supposed to be examined. But of course, it's supposed to be examined by people who are living these things themselves and who have great knowledge and, and are, uh, you know, uh, pursuing the churches thing rather than weeding out people that may not be uh, uh, they might be too too Catholic that they might be Orthodox with the small O and this and uh, we don't really want that uh, in my I, I you know let's say I wouldn't really want that and I'm a, a vocations director of a seminary but then what then you read those people out you get rid of them but uh, a sad book Call a goodbye, good men. I believe it was uh, uh, about that. That uh, about from the seventies, eighties, and even into the nineties. This given this thing of uh, how often uh, very good, devout, uh, balanced, emotionally balanced, and other things. Uh, uh, candidates were cast out because they were too Catholic. I was just talking with someone on the phone who was uh, uh, about to take temporary vows in the, this uh, congregation that he had been uh, you know, with for a good while, was a novice and other things. Maybe he had already taken temporary vows. But the provincial said, oh, you, you uh, maintain a belief in purgatory, don't you? And you insist on that. And he said, yes. And he said, well, you won't fit in here. So, and that's a doctrine of the church. Well, I guess it was the provincial that didn't fit in uh, into the church, stuff like that. So, uh, so they wanted a weed out uh, Orthodox so that they could, you know, uh, gradually turn the Catholic Church into basically a liberal Protestant church of some sort. Uh, you know, but why do that? But there are plenty of liberal Protestant churches that need people. So uh, there you go. If that's what your conscience. But uh, uh, an informed conscience would lead you to. That wouldn't be a Catholic conscience. And, and, and for the most part, I have not you know, people who've left and I have asked them why. They, uh, they often say, well, because of this and that. And it, uh, sometimes they're just superficial reasons that have and, and the same problems they'll find in any other place. Uh, but other times they, they're ignorant. They say, oh, you know, the Catholic Church teaches that you adore Mary as a goddess. Or that uh, uh, Jesus is killed every time at Mass. Or they, they, and it's, it's just plain ignorance. You're just plain ignorance. And sometimes it's people even who were, were, uh, you know, were, were religious, women religious or, or men religious or, 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 or clergy, priests going that. I can think of a couple right now who are uh, you know, very popular anti-Catholic 
uh, they do give their quite a part of their testimony about, about being delivered from the horror of Babylon for keeping the Catholic Church. But there, even one guy has a doctorate, and I said, how did he get a doctorate? And he's so ignorant of, of, of a lot of basic Catholic stuff and the Catholic positions, which he could actually easily find out. Uh, with the, although he let this guy left, I'm not going to mention his name, before the catechism was out, he could have easily found out, especially if, and he was in a religious order that was renowned for its uh, theological learning. Well, he wasn't. He was not someone like that. In fact, he himself admitted that he got his doctorate uh, through cutting a lot of corners, shall we say, and, and having other people do a lot of work for him. But uh, anyway, that's that. So, moreover, they should be tested first. There should be nothing against them, and let them serve. Let them serve as deacons. If there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Women. So, what are these women? Are these deaconesses? The diaconisa. This the and this is the New American. This seems to refer to women deacons, the deaconesses who are not actually women deacons. In a sense, of course, there's one reference that Saint Paul makes, and he calls a woman diakonos instead of diaconisa or anything like that. But diakonos could just mean minister or someone who serves. So it doesn't necessarily mean that, and especially in uh, a, a context uh, of, of, of really early on in, in, the, in the first generation of the church, where ter terminology would be very fluid. And concepts uh, are, may not be uh, fully developed. So uh, an interesting book to read on this is on the development of doctrine by uh, Saint uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman uh, uh, on that, that on this, uh, and on the development in the uh, history of the church, and how often when controversies come up, the the doctrines have to be more clarified. They have to, so, and of course, Vincent Laurent's image of uh, doctrine development of the the acorn, the and the tree developing continue to to grow out of this. So it's all there in the acorn, but it has to be developed. You know, different language uses, the different applications, but with different different times, with different uh, questions that come up that didn't come up before, or different difficulties there. You see this especially in uh, the morality of issues. So you know, like the Bible doesn't really mention anything about nuclear war, uh, test tube babies, all of this stuff. This, you, you have to rely more and more on apostolic tradition, the capital T, and uh, develop into natural law than on scripture per se. He goes on, so these are the the, these may well be that, or they could be women in service and, and, and other levels. Uh, the former, the deaconess, is preferred because the word is used absolutely. If deacons' wives were meant, because that could also be, but it's the uh, bishop's wives, you know, episcopa, which is it, it, dropping the masculine ending, the uh, on the consigna, ed, ed, uh, ending on it, and putting an alpha on it, a feminine ending. Uh, there could say, oh, some people have said, oh, this means that we're women bishops. But uh, on tombstones, it's, it's usually in reference, of all the references I know anyway, are to the wives of bishops. And the same thing with presbytera. In fact, presbytera is the, is the modern word for the wife of a priest in, in the Greek Orthodox Church and in the Greek Catholic Church, uh, in, in modern Greek and, in, uh, and even in uh, uh, borrowed in, into English uh, in, for that, that purpose. Uh, and so he says, 
If deacons, wives were meant, a possessive there would be expected. There. Moreover, they are also introduced by the word similarly. So talking about deacons and then uh, that. Uh, the deaconesses who uh, were not did not have the full function of deacons and so and were not considered a part of holy orders this parallel suggests that they too exercise ecclesiastical functions in the church and as a pope francis is saying, you know, women really need to have more and more uh, higher, high-level functions in the church and, and other things. And, and the ministry of women to be respected, uh, uh, the ministry of lay women to be as respected as the ministry of lay, lay men and as encouraged. But also the ministry of uh, religious sisters who are lay, but have a special calling, a special position in the church. And what does the... So it also goes on about... I'll do this before I get into this commentary. Verse 12, deacons may be married only once. Again, that's the... Uh, beautiful universal custom in the Catholic and Orthodox churches. So we have married deacons and restoration of the permanent diaconate. We have the to be married only once, uh, uh, literally, and uh, uh, not serially. So it, not married to one woman at a time, but only once, ever. And must arrange their children and their households well. Thus, those who serve well as deacons gain good standing and much confidence in their faith at Christ Jesus. So, uh, deacons, ministers who assist the bishops, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, and serve the needs of the poor, the sick, and widowed. They probably had limited liturgical responsibilities as well. So they're mentioned as assisting the bishops in baptisms. And the deaconesses are mentioned in assisting the baptisms, which were immersion, of women. So the bishop wouldn't go down into the water with the women, the deaconesses would. Uh, and often deaconesses would be holding up uh, sort of sheets up there, uh, blankets and stuff, so that uh, the woman wouldn't be seen uh, all uh, drenched and all that. Uh, it just didn't, it didn't seem seemly for bishop to be in the water with uh, the tradition of being baptized was uh, being baptized naked, so that just didn't uh, uh, seem appropriate. So the beginning of this office is sometimes traced to the seven men ordained for service in Act Six. So I had mentioned that earlier about uh, in that the mystery of the faith, the full range of revealed truths given through Christ. Paul regularly connects this with the Father's overarching plan to bring all nations into the kingdom of God. So the women, likewise, either a reference to the wives of the deacons or deaconesses. So we talked about that from the, uh, uh, a little earlier. Who assisted with the catechetical instruction and baptism of women, Romans 16.1. The church recognizes that deaconesses were appointed for special tasks, but not ordained for sacramental ministry in the strict sense. The First Council of Nicaea decreed in A.D. 325 that deaconesses are numbered among the laity and not among the clergy, Canon 19, and see the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1527. So we'll go on to that with the mystery of the faith, the mystery of our religion, uh, next week and verse 14. Let me mark that. <coughs> so let's say the Our Father together. Our Father who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have a hollow over here. Robin Lennon, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Well, everyone have a wonderful day. And let's continue to pray for each other. And remember, as St. Jerome said, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. Bye.